Welcome back to part three of Spiritual Authority. Who has it, who doesn't, and what you can do about it. I'm Chip Brogdon. Well, we've covered quite a bit of territory so far, so let's go back and quickly review what we have discussed in in the first message. Uh, We talked about the difference between power and authority, dunamis and exousia. And remember the difference because it's critical, especially as we start talking about the issue of what you can do about spiritual abuse, which is the title of this third message in the series. Uh, We said that power is the ability to do something. And that power can be for good or it can be for evil. It can be for a a noble purpose or it can be for a self-serving purpose. But that's power. That's dunamis. Authority, on the other hand, is the power, but along with it, the permission to act. So it's critical to our understanding, it's critical to your understanding, that uh, we know what the difference is. Authority always comes uh, from a higher source, and since Jesus has all authority, whatever authority there is, it is there because Jesus has given that authority, the power and the permission to act. Now, uh, we've talked about the four kinds of authority. There is domestic authority, which is the authority in the home of uh, parents have authority over their children. Husbands and wives have areas of authority. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we go further. Uh, But so uh, domestic authority. Secondly, civil authority, which we said is the government. Uh, And a couple of other things that I left out and I failed to mention where I would classify them as civil authority. Obviously, the government, the, uh, the, the political process, as well as the workplace. If, if you work on a job, then your, your boss, your employer, the person who signs your check and, and hires you and fires you, they have a certain amount of authority over you. And that is, uh, th- that is uh, easily verified if you look through the scriptures where it refers to, uh, to relationships between masters and slaves. Now, we don't have masters and slaves today for the most part, thank the Lord. But uh, the principle is there. If someone is paying you money, you owe that person uh, your time, your allegiance. You owe them a good day's work for a good day's pay and so there is a certain amount of authority there you don't you don't <laughs> you don't go work someplace and don't do what the boss says thinking that he doesn't have authority over you uh, there is civil authority and just as you would obey the policeman just as you would uh, obey the the laws and what the judge says if you were to go to court that's civil authority uh, if you're taking money from someone who is paying you to do a job then they become an authority in your life also. Not a spiritual authority, but a civil authority. And I would include in that organized religion as a civil authority because uh, organized religion is pretty much an institution in, in our society. And if you are on the staff of a church someplace, they have civil authority over you, just like a, an employer would have over an employee. Uh, if if you're going to participate in a church or if you're going to be a member of a denomination or a member of some kind of a fellowship or a group, then they have certain uh, guidelines, they have a constitution, they have a certain uh, hierarchy and their own little system of government. And so that is a civil authority. Now, they'll try to make it a spiritual authority, but I would just tell you that civil authority uh, has to do with whatever organization you're a part of, whether it's religious or non-religious, if it's in the workplace, if it's in government, anything that is not in the family and anything that is not spiritual, I'm putting together under civil authority. And uh, you can disagree with how I'm classifying this, and it's not going to make a a big deal. But this uh, this helps to determine where the lines of authority are, okay? And the third kind of authority we talked about is spiritual authority. And I classify that as the, the true church, the church that Jesus is building, the house that is uh, 
made of living stones that he is building upon the foundation of himself as opposed to the institutional church who says that the pastor is the spiritual head. Well, I'm talking about the church that Jesus is building that says that Jesus is the head of the church, which is his body and the fullness of him who fills all things. And that spiritual authority is within the priesthood of of every believer. Every disciple of Jesus has spiritual authority. And then within that church, It says in Ephesians 4, recall that he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the edification of the saints to build the church to till we all come to the full knowledge of Christ. And so we in part two, we expanded upon that a little bit to talk about why God gives spiritual authority. And remember, we said it's not so that people can control other people and it's not so certain people can get their own way. It is really, I believe, for three reasons. Number one, to serve people. Number two, to protect them. And number three, to teach them and to disciple them and see them grow up spiritually. Every example of spiritual abuse I've ever seen, they always violated all three of of these very basic things that I'm putting out. And, and that's why it's real easy to define what true spiritual authority is. You simply look at all the abuse and and uh, (laughs) draw conclusions that are the exact opposite of what you see uh, happening in many, many situations around the world. When someone is in in a position that they are spiritually abusing other people, they're not serving them. They are expecting to be served. They're certainly not protecting them, and instead they are taking advantage of them. And they're certainly not trying to teach them and help them to grow spiritually Uh, instead they are they are teaching them to become more and more dependent upon them and that's how they maintain control so uh, that's that's the exact opposite of why God gives spiritual authority in the first place and that's how you know that person who is behaving that way is not God's true spiritual authority so let's talk about what happens when spiritual authority is abused? Now, it's easy to see what happens in uh, civil authority when that civil authority is abused. What happens? People rebel. They either get rid they they get rid of that person that they elected. They elect somebody else, or if it's the case of your boss, you you walk in, you give him your resignation, you quit, and you leave. If it's the case of a domestic authority that is something going on in the family that's not right. Let's say the husband is abusing the wife. Well, hopefully the wife will leave the husband or the law will step in at that point and will remove that abusive person from the family. So uh, it, it seems like the world is better able to deal with abuses of authority it seems, than God's own people are, and that's a shame. So I I want to talk about what you can do about spiritual abuse because, let's face it, the cops are not going to show up and remove this person on the basis of spiritual abuse. (laughs) So it's going to be up to you to learn how to observe it and discern it and how to deal with it uh, with with, uh, the Word of God and with the authority Jesus has given you. So... A good example of spiritual abuse in the scripture and uh, and what what we need to learn from it, I think, uh, is found in Matthew 24. If you would turn to Matthew chapter 24, uh, Jesus is going to, to teach us about uh, spiritual authority and what it is and what happens when someone abuses that authority, which is all too common. Uh, Matthew chapter 24, verse 45 says this, Who then, Jesus is speaking, Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. In other words, uh, the, the master gives authority to certain servants, faithful and wise servants. He gives them authority over his household. Uh, Very critical verse here that helps us to really see 
how Jesus delegates spiritual authority. He looks for faithful and wise servants, and he makes them rulers. And again, we've got all kinds of of pictures in our mind when we say ruler. We're thinking of someone sitting behind a desk telling other people what to do, or we're thinking about a king sitting on a throne ruling and reigning over everybody. But again, if you'll keep in mind, God's spiritual authority is given for three purposes. It's to serve people, to protect them, and to teach them, uh, to help them to grow spiritually. And so you see here, his master His master gives him authority over the house to provide them with food in due season and to do what? Basically to serve his house, to be a steward, to be a servant over his house. And remember, folks, it is his house. It is his church. It is his sheep. When Peter was restored back to the Lord after he was after Jesus was raised from the dead, you you remember that Peter denied Jesus three times. Uh, No surprises there. Jesus says, this is what you're going to do. Peter denied it, said he'd never forsake him, but he did. And finally, he's restored after, after the resurrection. And Jesus says, feed my sheep. Now, notice he did not give the sheep to Peter. He didn't say, Peter, I want you to go take charge of these sheep over here. He said, Peter, all I want you to do is feed my sheep. He never gave the sheep to Peter. And in the, in similar manner, God does not give sheep or people and and place them with a pastor or a prophet or an apostle, and, and now they become his possession. The sheep always belong to the shepherd. The people always belong to Jesus. They never belong to me. They never belong to you. They are not your people. They are not your flock, pastor. They are not your congregation. They are the congregation of the Lord. They are the Lord's people. They are the Lord's uh flock and you are a shepherd a servant over his possession now what's going to happen is you're going to be called to give an account for how you handled the lord's people how you handled the lord's possession and so look what happens in verse 47 of matthew 24 if you're faithful Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. In other words, there is something else coming down the road in this future kingdom that how you live and how you treat people now is going to affect your position and the authority that you have in that kingdom to come. But look at what happens in verse 48. And and here is where we begin to get into the issue of spiritual abuse. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards, (laughs) guess what? The master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour that he is not aware of and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. In other words, if you abuse the authority that God gives you, if you take advantage of that authority and you begin to use that for your own purposes, you begin to beat your fellow servants and you begin to take advantage of them and you begin to live it up, eating and drinking with the drunkards. That's a good way to illustrate what happens when people take their title, take their position, take what little power they have and they begin to use it not in a way to glorify God but they use it in a way to glorify themselves and to feed themselves and to abuse and manipulate and control other people what happens well Jesus says first of all that's an evil servant (laughs) not a good and faithful and wise servant but an evil servant and the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and an hour that he is not aware of, will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So uh, that is a pretty strong warning that we need to make sure that if we are in a position of responsibility, and really, folks, that's all spiritual authority is. It is a position, it, it it is a place 
of responsibility for other people. Responsible for what? Responsible to serve them, to protect them, and to teach them. You might have authority in your home. I hope that whether you are a husband or a wife, if you have children, that you have authority to serve them, protect them, and teach them. Uh, that's your responsibility. They are your responsibility, and as a result, God gives you authority in that area. In civil authority, the same thing. With spiritual authority, it is no different. God is going to hold you accountable accountable for how you conducted yourself with that spiritual authority. So I'm going to, to talk about uh, this issue of spiritual abuse, and I'm I'm going to correct, I, I hope I'm going to correct, some of the misunderstandings that people tend to have that that set up the situations in which spiritual abuse can take place. Um, so I, I'm, I'm hopefully going to set some people free here and, uh, and get you to think a little bit differently about this whole issue of, of spiritual authority. Most of what Christians know and believe about spiritual authority, they got from uh, one of two kinds of sources or mindsets. Now, the, the, first, the first and the most widely known uh, source on spiritual authority is a book by Watchman Nee titled Spiritual Authority. Now, uh, that book has probably done more damage in the hands of fleshly, carnal, immature leadership than any other book that I'm aware of, and that's why I'm going to mention it, because uh, Watchman Nee is is a, he's with the Lord now, of course, but a, a very powerful and gifted writer with a depth of knowledge of, of Christ and of revelation. And so it's unfortunate that that someone would take that book out of context and then use it for their own purposes and use it in a way that Watchman Nee, I'm, I'm sure, would have never condoned. Uh, and here's what people don't understand. Watchman Nee's books were not written by Watchman Nee. He only wrote by hand himself uh, one or two books. And this book in particular was not written by him. It was written by someone else based on notes of one of his spoken messages. Now, I think if if Brother Nee had been able to edit this book, first of all, I don't think he would have published it. And second of all, if even if he did, I don't think it would read the way it does. Because... It was taken completely out of context and used by another man named Witness Lee, completely different from Watchman Nee, and uh, used to establish his own idea of what spiritual authority is supposed to look like in the church. Now, Witness Lee was very authoritative. He was a he was a real. Uh, a real control, uh, as you would say in, in today's vernacular, a real control freak. He really had a, a, a penchant for spiritual authority and control. He was a very authoritative type of person. Watchman Nee was not. Watchman Nee had spiritual authority, but you know what? Brother Nee would silently put up with anything. He never, ever defended himself. He never spoke up for his authority. That was never uh, what he was known for. Witness Lee was quite the opposite. Uh, let me give you an, an example of, of Watchman Nee uh, and how he never defended himself. He never behaved in the way in which people have taken that book that he supposedly wrote and then they've used that as a way to manipulate and control other people. Watchman Nee would never defend himself at all uh, to to an extreme. I believe there's sometimes when you should just when you should say something. But <laughs> he felt like the Lord would his, was his defender, and if God was with him, he did not need to defend himself at all. Quite a different perspective uh, from from people today who claim to have spiritual authority and the first time you ruffle their feathers they're ready just to to have you crucified uh watchman e was was 
visited by his mother one time, and some people in the neighborhood saw his mother going into his home, but they did not know it was his mother. And so they began to spread a rumor around town that Watchman Nee was seeing women, and, and he was not married at the time. So they started to spread a rumor that uh, Brother Nee was, was living in sin with, a, with another woman. And all of his friends knew that, that it was his mother, and they pleaded with him, why don't you put a stop to these rumors and tell these people that this is your mother? But he, he absolutely refused to defend himself because he knew uh, he knew he was right, and he did not have to defend his authority at all because he realized that God uh, was his authority. He was under the authority of God, and he didn't need to defend himself. Witness Lee, on the other hand, came to the United, came to the United States and started a group of, uh, of people, and even today, some of those people that we still run, in, run into contact with, they are very, very uh, controlling, or they are very apt to be controlled. Uh, completely different. So and I, I went through all of that just to say this. The main fault of this book, Spiritual Authority, which which is uh, was not written by Watchman Nee but translated by someone else and I believe taken out of context, the main fault with this book, there are some good things in it, but the main fault with this book is it is completely based on the Old Testament and it primarily uses Moses as the example of authority. Now, what we have to understand, get this, what we have to understand is that Moses in the Old Testament is a type of Christ. And all the illustrations of rebellion against authority should be interpreted that way. Moses is a type of Christ. So this whole concept of God's delegated authority has been completely and utterly misconstrued. God never, ever delegates his authority to anyone on the basis of their title or their position in a group of people or in a church or in any kind of an organization. He never sets up delegated authority on the basis of their title and or of their position. And even if he did, it would not give that person the permission to abuse or control or manipulate other people with impunity just because they call themselves the pastor, they call themselves a prophet, or they call themselves an apostle. Uh, so because so many people have read that book, and that became, in fact, that became a basis for um, one or two movements uh, around this issue of spiritual authority, and people were really, really abused and taken advantage of. So I want you to avoid that. If you do read that book, then at least uh, understand the context and understand the circumstances surrounding that book. Now, I mentioned, I mentioned Watchman Nee by name because I don't have a problem recommending his writings. That one book you do need to be aware of and uh, and understand the circumstances surrounding it. Now, there are many other messages and books out there with a similar mindset, one in particular that I'm not going to name because I don't want to give this person publicity. But the main idea put forth in his book and in these other books and teachings is you should never speak against or touch God's anointed. Touch not my anointed. Well, first of all, folks, all of you are anointed. Are anointed. Uh, John says that the anointing abides in you if you're walking in the light. And uh, if you're a disciple of Jesus, then you are anointed. But this idea of don't touch God's anointed and the example uh, that is frequently used is how David refused to harm Saul uh, because Saul was was God's anointed. And and so David just kind of put up with Saul. And, and the implication is that we're not supposed to rebel against God's authority. And even if they're wrong, even if they're not right, God will deal with them in due time. In the meantime, we're supposed to submit and obey. Well, that is absolutely false. And I'll tell you why. Because it, it, to use Saul as the example, you've got to keep in mind that Saul was not David's spiritual authority. Saul 
had authority in a civil capacity, not a spiritual capacity. In other words, Saul was the king. That's why David didn't kill him. That's why he didn't set his hand against him. It wasn't because he was he was spiritually where he needed to be. <laughs> it was because he was a civil authority. He was the king. And so, obviously, David is not going to stretch forth his hand and and harm the king. Now, for ministers, pastors, prophets, apostles, teachers to use this as an example of how we're supposed to submit to them even if they're wrong, that is a very gross distortion, and it's taking it out of context and it's setting you up to be abused. You need to have your your ears wide open at this point, folks. It, when people start talking about how you're supposed to submit, and that's what they're teaching on, that's what they're harping on is submitting, 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 unless they're talking about submitting to Jesus, submitting to his lordship. When they start talking about and preaching about and teaching about how you're supposed to submit to them, you better run in the opposite direction. So... <laughs> Let's talk about how to identify spiritual abuse. Uh, The the first step to identifying spiritual abuse is to understand the difference. Again, I keep harping on this because it's so critical. And I don't know if I've communicated it thoroughly enough, and so I've got to keep repeating it. The first step to identifying spiritual abuse is to understand the difference between authority and power. People who have no spiritual authority, if you give them power, here's what's going to happen. They, are, they will always abuse others with it. They'll manipulate people with it. They'll control people with it. And if you go against them, they will pout. They will become enraged. They will punish, ridicule, and verbally abuse anyone who does not agree with them. Now, some may do it with a smile on their face, and some may do it with uh, with uh, steam coming out of their ears. Either way, people who have no spiritual authority, when you give them power, when you give them a title, when you make them in charge of something, that's how they're going to behave in a, in a religious or in a church context. Now, folks, it doesn't matter if it's the First Baptist Church or if it's some kind of a home group that's meeting in a person's living room, it doesn't matter. I've seen the same thing because people do not change. The flesh is the flesh. It doesn't matter if it's the flesh out in the world, if it's the flesh in an organized church, or if it's the flesh in a Bible study. It's the same thing. People who have no spiritual authority, when you give them power, they will always, always abuse other people with it and use it to manipulate, control, and uh, trying to bend everyone else to their will. And if you cross them, if you resist them, they become uh, angry. And if, they're in, if they have the power to do so, they will try to punish or ridicule you in return. So that's how power operates. People with spiritual authority, true spiritual authority, will never, ever ever abuse other people they will never seek to manipulate or control other people even if they have the power to do so they still will not do so that's how spiritual authority true spiritual authority operates so the way you identify this is uh, you look at the person and you determine if they're operating in spiritual authority or fleshly power it's it's very simple now just like you can look at the devil and you can see an example of power in the in in the in the sense that the devil does what he comes to steal kill and destroy he is a liar and the father of lies and just as you can look to Jesus as an example of how someone with spiritual authority behaves you can look at the devil as an example of how someone who does not have spiritual authority has to behave Listen to what I'm telling you, folks. The devil doesn't have authority in your life unless you give him permission. He doesn't have authority in your life. That's why he has to do what? Control, manipulate, deceive, steal, kill, destroy, lie. Why? If he had spiritual authority, he wouldn't have to do all of that. Think about it, folks. Spiritual authority never, ever abuses others, even if... 
you have the power to abuse others or manipulate others. Spiritual authority will keep you from doing that. You won't need to do that. Those who have no spiritual authority, they have no choice. They have no option except to abuse, manipulate, and use power to try and control and deceive other people. Well, that's exactly how the devil operates. So that should prove to you right there the devil has no real authority until and unless you give him permission. So in, in a similar manner, learn how to observe a person and determine if they are operating under spiritual authority or fleshly power. For example, uh, do, do they expect you to reverence them because of their title? I mean, if, if they are really harping on the fact that they are pastor so-and-so or prophet so-and-so or apostle, bishop, reverend so-and-so, it may be that they're just immature, okay? At, at, at the least, if they harp on that, if they really emphasize that, Maybe they're just immature, or it could be a clue that they expect you to submit to them or give them reverence based on their title. That's that's a dead giveaway that they are into power, but they don't have spiritual authority. I'm trying to tell you, spiritual authority will never abuse others. It will never demand that other people submit to them. Uh, (laughs) Praise the Lord. Let's, Let's do this. Let's practice on the examples I gave you in the beginning of this series. Let's go back and look at some of these scenarios that I, that I threw out there in the introduction and, and see if we can't identify the spiritual abuse that's going on and, and shed, shed some light on these situations, which are very, very common, by the way. Very, very common. We get a lot of email from people who are experiencing things like this, very similar things. We have also been in house churches, home groups, home fellowships. We've certainly done our share of, um, had our share of experiences in the organized church in in denominationalism. So uh, these these situations are very familiar. They happen all the time. Let's use what we've learned so far and see if we can't. Uh, pick up on the spiritual abuse here and discern it and identify it because that's the first step to to dealing with it. Uh, okay, for the, the first example we gave, a pastor refuses all correction on the basis that he is the spiritual authority in the church <laughs> and therefore is above question. Those who disagree are ridiculed and ultimately forced to leave. Well, uh, what does the Bible say? Well, the Bible doesn't say that the pastor is the head of the church. It says that Jesus is the head of the church. Jesus is the head of the church, and there's only one head. He doesn't have several heads. He only has one head. Jesus is the head of the church, and, you know, I have seen some church constitutions, and they say that the pastor is the spiritual head of the church. Well, I disagree. He might have authority in the church as the civil head of that organization, if he's the, the director of the nonprofit organization or if he is the one who decides to bring on staff members or whatever, uh, he may have some authority in that area, but to refuse all correction on the basis that he is the spiritual head of the church is, um, is absolutely uh, wrong <laughs> because Jesus is the head of the church. Now, what you need to do if you find that you are in disagreement with the pastor, you shouldn't stay there and continue to disagree with that pastor, especially if he's refusing correction and if he's ridiculing you. See, that, that's a good indication right there. If, if the pastor starts talking about you from the pulpit <laughs> and talking about how uh, people are, are talking against him. That, that's a good indication, folks, that he is, he is in an area that he doesn't need to be. That's spiritual abuse. That's trying to control and, manip- and manipulate other people and ridiculing other people because they don't agree with you. On the basis that you're the spiritual head of the church, is, um, that's a power play that has nothing to do with authority. He doesn't have spiritual authority because he's relying on power. Jesus is the head of the church, okay? Now, I, I've run into this many times, but I would advise you in a situation like this that you not stay 
or remain in an organization or in a group in which the person who is in charge uh, does not like you and you do not agree with them. If you do not see eye to eye on something, don't stay. I made that mistake when, when I was an associate pastor uh, in a church and God was just beginning to show me some things and be- just beginning to show me that Jesus is the head of the church. And that caused an immediate uh, conflict between me and the and the senior pastor. And uh, we'd have these conversations and I, I remember sitting in his office one time, and uh, he wanted to correct me, but he, he really couldn't. And he said, you know, this is kind of awkward because you don't recognize my authority as the head of the church. <laughs> and I said, no, I really don't. I believe Jesus is the head of the church. And see, what I should have done at that point is I should have just resigned. Instead, I stayed there, and uh, they ended up kicking me out anyway. But the, the the point of that, folks, is even though he doesn't have, even though the pastor is not the spiritual head of the church, he is, however, the civil authority there. And if he's the pastor of that church and you don't agree with how he's doing things, uh, you should you should pray about it and either uh, either find a way to work it out or you should or you should just leave. But uh, that's. That's an example there again of someone claiming spiritual authority who doesn't have any. That's that's my point. Jesus is the head of the church. Well, then in a, in a similar manner, uh, a man claims to be the spiritual head of the house, and he rules his family with such an iron grip that his wife and children are terrified of him. Well, <laughs> can you see the spiritual abuse there? First of all, I don't see any phrase in the Bible that says anything about the spiritual head of the house. Where did that phrase come from? Jesus is the only head. He is the head of the church. And so anyone who is ruling his family with such an iron grip that his wife and children are terrified of him, does that sound like the spirit of Jesus to you? It certainly doesn't to me. It sounds more like a, a control, manipulation. And God has not given us a spirit of fear. He does not rule us with terror and with fear. So... Uh, Anyone who is behaving that way to his family, uh, he needs to be corrected. He needs to, you know, that's not all he needs, but as a beginning, he needs to be corrected. Uh, that's not what a, what a spiritual head of the house does. There's no such thing. Jesus is the head. Jesus doesn't act that way. That's not the spirit of Jesus to behave in that manner, period. Uh, in another family, because and this happens so many times because the man is not uh, outwardly interested in spiritual things the woman says you know it's up to me to, to become the spiritual head of the house in the place of my husband i don't see that in the scripture either where does it say that the man is the spiritual head of the house and where does it say that if he doesn't behave like the spiritual head of the house then the woman becomes the spiritual head of the house it would be so much easier If instead of inventing all of these titles and positions, if we would just recognize what the Bible says, that Jesus has all authority in heaven and in earth, and that includes your house. So let Jesus be the head of your house. Why is that so difficult for people to understand? (laughs) Just let Jesus be the head of your house. And then if your husband is not where he needs to be, well, Jesus can straighten that out. But if you're not where you need to be, he can straighten that out too. Uh, and, and it, most of this mindset is coming from uh, people who take passages out of context. In Ephesians 5, um, five uh, let's read in Ephesians 5, uh, 18, beginning there, because it's going to talk about these relationships. Uh, it says, Do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Submitting to one another. Now look at this, verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. And let's stop right there at that point. Now, I'm I'm not arguing one way or the other, and I'm not saying that, uh, that 
the husband is not the head of the wife and that wives aren't supposed to submit to their husbands, I'm saying, what do you think that means? <laughs> what does it mean for the husband to be the head of the wife? If, if the husband has authority, what does that mean? Does it mean that he's supposed to rule them with an, with an iron fist? That he's supposed to force her to do whatever he wants? Is that what you think spiritual authority is? Well, why don't we just go back and connect this to what we're saying spiritual authority is based on Scripture. Why does God give authority at all? Why is the husband the head of the wife? Well, it says the husband is the head of the wife just as also Christ is the head of the church. So how does, how does Jesus govern his church? How does Jesus govern his body? Uh, does he do it with an iron fist? Does he yell and scream and threaten? Does he force people to do something that they don't want to do? No, basically, he just loves us into obedience. He loves us into obedience. <laughs> so think about it, husbands. How and why does God give you authority? It is for serving your wife, protecting your wife, teaching your children. Hello? It's not that difficult. But whenever you take this passage and you try to you try to take it and apply it with fleshly hands, with a carnal mindset, then you're, all you're doing is, is you are abusing uh, your wife. You are not loving your wife. And, uh, and it's, so it, it's very plain. And, and then the, the next aspect of this, uh, the next example I gave you, uh, really reveals a problem between uh, men and women to begin with when you start talking about spiritual authority. And it's the example of a house church, let's say, where all the women are supposed to be submissive. And what that means is they're supposed to sit separately from the men. They're not allowed to speak, but they're supposed to keep the children, cook all the, the meals, clean up afterwards, and the men just kind of sit back and watch while the women do all the work. Well, you know what? The Scripture does not say women must submit to men. Where does it say that? It says wives submit to your own husband. It does not say women submit to all men everywhere. See, that's the, that's the mindset over in the Middle East where uh, the, the man has complete authority over the, over the woman. They're not even supposed to show their face in public. And if, if you're married to a woman who does not uh, please you, then it's okay for you to beat up on her. Well, the way some people take these passages, the way some Christians take these passages out of context, they're no better than that mindset over there. That's not what God gave us, gave us the scripture for. That's not the proper use of authority. It doesn't say women submit to men. It says wives submit to your own husband. Now, I'm going I'm to tell you something. My, my, wife, my wife is not going to submit to any man on the basis of gender. You can forget that. She, she's going <laughs> to exercise her spiritual authority and bring you correction if you try to uh, get her to submit to you on the basis that women are supposed to submit to men. Uh, again, it's taking a partial truth and then twisting it for your own fleshly uh, ends and your own carnal mindset, and that's what we're coming against right now. Uh, we're talking about spiritual abuse. Here's another good example. Uh, a house church where the founding apostle is treated as a guru with with absolute reverence and no one makes a move or does anything apart from his approval and even on on matters of deciding where to live or where they can work and who they can go visit and who can come visit them uh b do you see the problem here basically this person has replaced the holy spirit they have replaced the holy spirit in the life of the people uh in the lives of the people that are are supposed to be submitted to this person. I, I've seen this, and it is ugly, and it is a shame. And uh, if, if you're in a situation like that, and you were looking to some apostle or some prophet to tell you where to go and how high to jump and, and when and where, and you were allowing that person to control you and manipulate you, and you have you have given that person permission to be the Holy Spirit in your life. And I'm not willing to do that. I am not going to give anyone permission to be the Holy Spirit in my life. I want to be led by the Spirit. I don't want to be led by some man or some woman who thinks that they have a, a, a calling or a ministry or a title that gives them 
the right to tell me when and where to to live and how to dress and what to say and what to think. And you think, well, I'd never fall for that. Well, you'd be surprised the number of people that are in these kinds of groups. In fact, uh, we had a circumstance like that. I went and, and we did a teaching in a group, and we uh, encountered some, some things that I felt like or that were um, – kind of borderline well then it, it was it was confirmed because one of the persons in this group after we left they contacted us and they wanted to come visit us and we said absolutely come on down and and you can stay over the weekend and we can fellowship or whatever and um then uh, we thought all was fine but then a few days later um we heard from them again got an email from them and they said well i, I told this person the uh, the the man in charge of this little group I told this person that, that I was going to come see you guys, and he said he didn't think it would be a good idea, so I guess I'm not going to come after all. Now, <laughs> now, first of all, why would he not think it's a good idea? And second of all, why would you value his opinion over what uh, the Holy Spirit is telling you to do? Why would you check with this person? Why would you seek this person's approval? for who you should see and who you shouldn't see. See, folks, that is a cult. There is no way around that. That is spiritual abuse uh, gone wild. That, that is that is spiritual abuse to the extreme. And uh, you, you may not be involved in a situation that extreme, but you may be involved with a prophet or with a pastor or with an apostle or with with just some brother or sister who uh, has this certain... Uh, aura about them, and you need to watch out for it. You need to resist it. You need to be able to identify the spiritual abuse and not not be complicit with it. Don't give that person permission to replace the Holy Spirit in your life. Uh, another good example: whenever you someone questions the church leadership, they get labeled as rebellious or having a spirit of Jezebel. I've, I've heard that a thousand times. You know that's a real convenient label. But uh, in Galatians 2, when Peter was, uh, was not behaving in accordance with the truth of the gospel, Paul rebuked him in front of all of them. And he wasn't labeled as being rebellious or having a, a spirit of Jezebel. If someone needs to be corrected, they need to be corrected. If they're not walking uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, it doesn't matter if it's Peter or, or Paul or Barnabas or who they are. If they can't receive the correction, and if they can't uh, the, if they can't listen to it without labeling the person trying to do the correcting as having a spirit of Jezebel, then it shows a problem. It, it shows that that they are caught up in power, but they don't really have authority. Or how about an apostle that convinces a handful of pastors that they should submit to his authority and send him tithes and offerings every week? <laughs> Oh, that's a classic case, and and believe me, there are, there are people that actually succeed in doing this. Uh, well, he's not an apostle. Paul was a was a real apostle, and Paul said we work with our own hands so that we can provide for our needs and not be chargeable to anyone. And uh, he says if you won't if you don't work, then you ought not to eat. And uh, to the Ephesian elders, he says, I've been with you three years. I've never taken anything from you. I've worked for everything I've had to have. And so anyone who is going around doing that on the basis of, of their spiritual authority, uh, that's pretty easy. Just just uh, cross them off the list right now because they do not represent the spirit of Jesus. How about a prophet who gives a word, quote, unquote, and it's obviously wrong, it's obviously off base, but for some reason no one has the courage to speak up and say so. Well, my question is, why not? If you know it's wrong, if you know it's off base, why can't someone stand up and say that's wrong? Why can't they bring correction? Where's that fear coming from that prevents you from saying, no, I disagree with that, I, I don't receive that, I don't see where that lines up in the Scripture. Can you show me? I mean, you don't have to be ugly about it. But where's the fear coming from that no one would even have the courage to speak up and say, no, that's not right? Uh, God doesn't operate in fear. He's not given us a spirit of fear, but power, love, 
and a sound mind. So you can bring correction. You can certainly ask questions. But uh, just just look at how they how that prophet responds to you, and then you'll begin to get an inkling of whether or not they have true spiritual authority or whether they're just exercising fleshly power. Well, how about that prayer group that spends hours and hours rebuking the devil, but strangely enough, the more they pray, the worse things get. Well, it's simply because they don't know the difference between power and authority. They're trying to rebuke the devil on the basis of power, but they don't understand the authority that is already theirs, that is already theirs in Christ. If they understood spiritual authority, they wouldn't have to spend hours rebuking anything. They could spend uh, a fraction of that time praising God for the victory that is already theirs. And, and um, I, I encourage you to look at my uh, teaching series on victory to uh, really give you a, a deeper understanding of that. Uh, this whole idea of rebuking the devil, it, it presumes that the devil has a lot more power and authority than he really has. And if, if you were to be as educated about the, the spiritual authority that is yours in Jesus Christ, how you were seated together with him in the heavenly places, if you knew half as much about him and the authority that is yours in him as you did about what you think the devil is doing in this world, then you would be an overcomer and the devil would give you a wide berth and you would not experience uh, nearly as much as the problems as what you're experiencing right now as far as the devil is concerned. Now, people will always give you problems. In the world, you'll always have tribulation. But some things you do have authority over in the spirit, and the devil is, is one of those things. So uh, I encourage you to get that that teaching series on victory. That really goes into a more in-depth understanding. Uh, and believe me, I have been in the in those prayer groups. I have spent hours and hours rebuking the devil. If you've not heard my testimony, uh, I can assure you that I am speaking from a position of having had more than 20 years of experience doing these very things, being a part of these very things. And uh, God has had grace on me and given me revelation so that I can come to a place of maturity. And now I see the light. Now I see the truth. And um, so I, I can I can teach on that basis. So don't write in and try to explain how your situation is different and think that I don't know all about this spiritual warfare and, and you know, uh, principalities and powers and intercession. Believe me, I have forgotten more than some people will ever know about that stuff. And thank the Lord that God revealed Christ to me and showed me the victory that is ours in him. I don't spend any time now rebuking the devil. Why in the world should I rebuke the devil when the devil's already been rebuked, when the devil's already been defeated? Um, again, I encourage you to get that, that teaching series so that you can, uh, you can pursue that on your own. Uh, how about a married couple who wants to leave the church, but the pastor says they would lose their spiritual covering unless he releases them first so they are afraid to leave? Again, where in the world do we get these terms and these phrases and these practices? And it's no different than the Pharisees, folks. It's, it, it is the same thing where Jesus said to them, you nullify the word of God with your tradition. We've got all these traditions and all these things that we invent like spiritual covering and releasing somebody. We're who who says that a pastor has the authority to be the spiritual covering over someone and can release them or not release them? Uh, show me the scripture where it says that. Uh, well, I, I know you can take scriptures and pull them out of context, but here's my thing. Here's my point. If Jesus is your spiritual covering, then you should be able to come and go wherever you want without fear, Right. I mean, the the spiritual covering of a local church someplace or the spiritual covering of a pastor, that's not a very strong covering as far as I'm concerned. That's not going to really do much by, by way of protecting me from from the things that are in the world and, and the things that uh, that I encounter on a daily basis. I don't know about you. I need something a little bit stronger than whatever spiritual covering a local uh, church or a pastor or a prophet or an apostle can give me, I would rather just let Jesus be my, my spiritual covering. If there is such a thing, uh, he's going to be it. He's, he's the authority. Uh, all power, all authority belongs to him. 
And if Jesus is my spiritual covering, if he is my head, if I'm submitted to him, if I'm walking in his will, then it shouldn't make any difference whether I go to your church or not. I should be able to come and go without fear, and uh, I, I'm, I'm released. I'm free. I, I'm not bound. I'm not bound. Uh, I'm not waiting for someone to release me at all. <laughs> the Son of God has made me free, and I am free indeed. Jesus is my spiritual covering. How about you? Who is your spiritual covering? Well, I would suggest... You, you make Jesus your spiritual covering, and then you can come and go whether the pastor releases you or not. Praise God. Okay. Now, uh, again, those are, are just some examples that we could use to practice on. Uh, but now let's let's get practical. What can you do about spiritual abuse, especially if you're the one that's being victimized, if you're the one that's on the receiving end of, of some of these uh, people, some of these fruits and nuts, and these false uh, prophets and false apostles and hirelings. What do you do if you're on the receiving end of, of this kind of, of spiritual abuse? Well, I want to give you some pointers. Number one, trust your discernment. That is the number one thing that I could tell you. I, I, cannot, I cannot know your situation. I cannot tell you uh, what, what is and what is not of God about your situation you're the one that's there you're the one that's in the situation you're the one that's in the circumstance and you have the holy spirit if you're born again you have the holy spirit with within who who will lead you into all truth and will tell you the truth and reveal the truth to you by way of discernment most people have a very very good sense of discernment they have a very good understanding of their environment they might not they might not uh they, they might not like what they sense but most of the time what they are sensing is correct and if something doesn't sit right with you there's a reason why it doesn't sit right with you but where i see most people fail is they fail to trust their discernment. They have a certain discernment about a person or about a church or about a group, but instead of trusting that discernment, they begin to rationalize that discernment, and pretty soon they become involved with something that they wish they hadn't. So the number one thing I would say, what you can do about spiritual abuse, trust your discernment, because 99.9% .9 of the time, if something doesn't sit right with you, there's a reason why and you, you should pay attention to it. I've had people write in and say, here's my situation, and they'll send me this long email. And by the time I finish reading it, it is pretty obvious that there's a problem and that their discernment is correct. But they always end the email by saying, what do you think? I'm really not sure. Listen, trust your discernment. That's the best advice I could give you. Trust your discernment. Holy Spirit lives within you. You don't need to check with anyone. If something doesn't feel right, if it, if it doesn't sit right with you or with your spirit, uh, trust your discernment. Number two, what, once you know that, that you're on the receiving end of, of spiritual abuse, uh, remove yourself immediately. Separate yourself. Cut off all contact from that person who is abusing you. If you're in a group, and uh, that group is being led by a person. Doesn't matter if it's a pastor of the of a Methodist church, or if it's the uh, the leader of a house church, or if it's the, a prophet of some kind of a discussion group on the internet. I'm not sure how you how you relate to other people or, or what your connection to a particular group may be. But if you're in a situation where you see these things happening, remove yourself immediately. Cut off all contact. You're under no obligation to go to them and explain all this stuff and and try to talk to them because, uh, you know, uh, Jesus said they are blind leading the blind. Leave them alone because if the blind lead the blind, they'll both fall into the ditch. Uh, you need to wake up, open your eyes, and just leave them alone. Just walk away. Remove yourself immediately. Cut off all contact because it's not going to do you any good to go and try to have a conversation with someone who is spiritually abusing you. 
Just like I would counsel a woman who is being abused by her husband physically, I would not advise her to go and have a conversation with her husband and explain to him that she's leaving. Uh, she just needs to get out of the house. I mean, that's common sense. Spiritually speaking, it's the exact same thing. Remove yourself immediately from that pastor who's abusing you, from that prophet who's taking advantage of you, from that apostle that wants you to send him tithes and offerings. Cut off all contact. Refuse their phone calls. Refuse their emails. Refuse their letters. If they come to, to your house, do not open the door. I mean cut off all contact. You have got to get serious. You have got to be bold. You have got to rise up. And that leads me to number three. Stop giving them permission. Stop giving them permission to abuse you. When, whenever someone takes power and they abuse you with it, or whenever they take authority and they begin to abuse you with it, you have to give them permission. If you don't give them, if you stop giving them permission, they no longer have the power to abuse you. Even Jesus, think about this, folks. Even Jesus, who can open any door that he wishes, or he could even walk through the wall if he wants to. Nevertheless, in Revelation, it says that he is standing at the door and knocking, and he will wait until we open the door before he comes in to have fellowship with us. That's Now, folks, it doesn't get any better than that. That's, that's, a, that's as good an illustration of the proper use of spiritual authority as any that I, I can see in the Scripture. Jesus has all authority in heaven and earth. And even in Revelation, it says that he, he, when he opens the door, no man can close it. And when he closes the door, no man can open it. Yet he is standing at the door knocking, waiting for us to open the door before he will come in and have fellowship with us. What, what an awesome example that is of spiritual authority. Now, if that's the case with the one who has all authority, certainly the devil has to have your permission before he can have the authority to do anything or, or uh, to affect you in any way. He has to have your permission. Now, how, now how does the devil get your permission? Well, he doesn't come up and ask you for it. <laughs> that would be too direct. He, he gets your permission in more subtle ways by getting you to, to fall in, to uh, yield to, to sin, tempting you to sin if you've got sin in your life or if you are not submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Uh, that you have you have basically given the devil permission to come in and rob you and abuse you in those areas. Uh, don't blame the devil. He's just doing what, what he does naturally. He's a liar and the father of lies. What you need to do is stop giving the devil permission. Don't give him permission by uh, living in sin, having unconfessed sin in your life, uh, living for yourself, uh, refusing to take up the cross, living in disobedience, all of these things, they simply give the devil permission, and so it's no wonder that you have the problems that you have when you've got those doorways open. So uh, he cannot and will not come around if you do not give him permission. Uh, when he does come, you can rebuke him and, and uh, uh, resist him, and he will flee, just as, as he did with Jesus. Okay? That's not really your, your main concern. Your main concern is going to be the false teachers, the false prophets, the hirelings, these false Christs that Jesus says will come, and they will lead many people astray. Well, they're able to lead people astray because they give away their power or they give away uh, permission. They give permission to these people to come in and take advantage of them. So I'm saying stop giving these people permission. Stop listening, you know, and that's why I say cut off all contact. If they can't contact you and you don't give them permission, then they can't influence you for for evil, okay? So we're talking about what you can do about spiritual abuse, giving you some very practical steps here. Number one, trust your discernment. Number two, remove yourself completely from the person who's doing the abuse. Number three, stop giving them permission. Remember, even Jesus waits until you voluntarily uh, respond and receive him before he, he... He doesn't intrude into your life. And if Jesus doesn't intrude into your life, certainly the devil uh, shouldn't be able to. So in like manner, the people that the devil uses, false teachers, false prophets, false Christs, hirelings, people who are 
abusing their authority and their power uh, in a religious context. They shouldn't have your permission either. So stop giving them permission and stop submitting to people on the basis of what they think submission is supposed to be. Don't uh, stop submitting to people on the basis of some kind of a title that they have. And you think, well, they, they're a prophet. I better not say anything against them. Look, um, you need to have more wisdom than that, folks. You need to have more wisdom and stop giving them permission. Okay? Um, number four. Now, on a more positive note, become familiar with true spiritual authority. And the best way to be to be acquainted with the genuine, or, or the best way is to be acquainted with the genuine, then you can recognize the counterfeit. Uh, become familiar with true spiritual authority, and the best way is to look to Jesus. Look to Jesus, look into the Word, and again, I keep repeating it, see how the man who has all authority and all power in heaven and earth, see how he behaves. See how he treats other people. What's his motivation? Love. And that is the best way to become familiar with true spiritual authority. And if you'll do that, you'll see Jesus... uh, and you'll see how most people fall short of that. But then it becomes very, very easy for you to discern the difference between true spiritual authority and spiritual abuse in the form of power. The best way is to look at Jesus. And then if you can find a trusted brother or a sister that you can confide in or that you can pray with or who can give you counsel, someone who's more mature in the things of the Lord than you. And unless you are absolutely spiritually mature, there is always someone out there who has a, a greater depth of wisdom and knowledge than you do in certain areas. Well, see if you can find a trusted brother or a sister, someone who has no agenda, you know, not, not someone who's going to try to say, well, you know, come join my church or give to my ministry or submit to me. And let me disciple you, let me mentor you. Now, I mean, just find a brother or a sister who has no agenda like that, who can can be an encouragement, be a prayer partner, someone with whom you can, um, you can learn about true spiritual authority. Again, the best example is Jesus. And then uh, see if you can't find a brother or a sister who has spiritual authority that you can learn from. I don't, I don't mean a title, and I don't mean power. I don't mean a position someplace. You may be able to find someone that has all of that and really has spiritual authority. Uh, but I, I would recommend just looking uh, to someone who has no, none of that and really become familiar with, with the genuine spiritual authority. That way you can easily, easily discern people who are not operating in that genuine spiritual authority. Number five, and the, and the final suggestion I have for you, what you can do about spiritual abuse is increase in your own spiritual authority. Learn what spiritual authority is and then begin to increase your own spiritual authority so that not only will you not be taken advantage of, but you will be able to help and minister to and comfort and encourage and support and protect and serve and teach those other people who are being abused by those who claim to have spiritual authority. Increase in spiritual authority so that you're not on the defensive all the time. You can begin to be on the offensive. As you increase in spiritual authority, as you increase in boldness and in confidence, not a fleshly arrogance, but a confidence in the Lord, you become secure in who you are in Christ. You become centered and focused on Jesus, and you begin to increase in spiritual authority, and you will find that instead of being on the receiving in of all of this stuff, you can go on the offensive and you can bring correction. You can bring rebuke to those who are behaving in this manner and you can be a defender of the weak. You can be an encourager and a strengthener to people who are being beat up and are being abused and you can help them to discover true spiritual authority in Christ and you can restore them to fruitfulness in the body of Christ and in the church. And what a powerful thing that is to see the tables turn to from becoming a from being a victim of spiritual abuse 
to actually overcoming, increasing in spiritual authority, and then being the means through which other people are able to find freedom and liberty in Christ. It's a powerful, powerful incentive for you to to really become familiar with spiritual authority and seek to increase your spiritual authority. And so that's what I want to talk about when we continue with our series in Message 4, How to Increase Your Spiritual Authority. <laughs> 